broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Pentecost with APA Virginia Chapter Staff. Thanks for joining us for the monthly webinar series, Your Hour with APA Virginia Chapter, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Thank you to the Berkeley Group for making this webinar series happen. We can grow each and every month. And it's a great way to highlight best planning practices and other cool things going on in Virginia. And we're always looking for presenters. So feel free to reach out to myself, Sarah Pentecost. And you can reach me at Sarah at apavirginia.com. That's Sarah with an H. And I'm looking to fill the calendar after um, for July on out. These happen the first Monday of each month, unless there's a holiday. This Monday, we've moved it up for Memorial Day. Um, go from noon to one and cover lots of topics in the planning field. So if you have a cool idea, reach out. Um, CM credit info for this webinar is available on the website, virginia.planning.org, and I will send a follow-up email out to everyone registered and attending today's webinar that will let you check your student credit. If you have any questions, please contact Andrew Hopewell, our professional development officer. And as a reminder, most of our webinars are available for on-demand education with APA's new Learn program. So if you go look at these webinars on our YouTube channel, you can find it under APA Virginia. In the comment section, we've added CM info to be able to watch these and log it retroactively. So that's a, a new opportunity, a new benefit to the webinar series that we've been able to offer our members. And the webinar series is currently available to anyone, not just Virginia and not just Virginia members. So always feel free to share these with your colleagues. Um, please mark your calendars for next month's webinar on June 24th with Andrew Painter of The Land Lawyers. He's doing part two of his Rise of the Legion lecture on the history of growth in Northern Virginia. So if you tuned in about a year ago, he did a part one lecture and it was very well received. So we're going to have him do part two. Part one is on our YouTube channel. So if you missed it and you want to catch up you can watch that and then tune in next month to hear the rest of it um, and then as a reminder registration for the annual conference is open early bird rates are available through june 30th so make sure you take advantage of that we have a very heavily discounted rate for students uh, we also have a very discounted rate for planning commissioners in that so if you're a planning commissioner and you want to come to the conference, register by June 30th to take advantage of that free conference registration. Um, that's hard to come up with. So um, I will now launch into today's webinar. We're excited to host Parker Smith with Cypress Parables. Um, Parker has over 10 years of experience working in community and regional planning. From 2007 to 2014, Parker served as a land use and affordable housing planner for county government in North Carolina. Today, he serves as a senior community economic development manager at Cypress Creek Renewables, where he works on community benefit agreements, workforce development, and provides zoning and land use guidance for large scale solar project development in the Southeast and the Atlantic. And so today, he is here to talk about utility scale solar developments in Virginia. And I will now hand it over to Parker. Um, and just as a reminder, we'll do all questions at the end. So you can type them in the questions box. And then in the last few minutes of the webinar, we will take a look at those. And then if you look in the handouts tab, there are four handouts um, that Parker can speak to. So I will now hand it over to him. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Fantastic. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Parker Sloan with Cypress Creek Renewables. 
I'm happy to have this, this opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, I've been working on uh, solar farm, solar project development in Virginia uh, for about two years now, and just thought this would be a good opportunity to um, talk about it further, talk a little bit about the construction process, um, what's involved um, in the land use, and um, just you know, based on on my experience with all the questions I've gotten over the over the last two years, um, like Sarah mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm I consider myself a, a planner by training. Um, I should say I'm not an attorney, and I'm not an electrical engineer. Um, although we'll certainly cover some of those topics um, today, as you might imagine, um, all of that is is very relevant to this um, this form of development. Um, <clears throat> The, there's several handouts that, that are shared with you. You know, one of them is this, this slide deck, and and you know my contact information there is on the on the front page. So feel free to to reach out to me um, anytime in the future. I'd be happy to talk about it further. I just want to mention, real, you know, real fast who, who we are, um, and just get this out of the way. You know, we're an integrated um, solar farm, uh, solar energy company uh, that works across the United States. Um, you know, we've, we've worked and developed and, and constructed um, dozens to, to hundreds of, of solar projects um, in, in a variety of, of um, you know, environmental conditions and, um, and part, different parts of the country. Um, and you know, we, we own and operate um, you know, most of our projects for the, for the life of, uh, of their, their useful life, um, which can, can reach up into the 30 year range. And we don't do, you know, residential development or uh, rooftop commercial type development. We're we're strictly um, in the business of of doing ground mounted um, solar facilities. And so, I'm going to talk about a few things here with you. Um, you know, primarily want to talk about the the equipment that's used, the differences in that equipment, what that might mean um, for the design. And how it fits into your, your different communities, um, you know what land is is suitable, what types of, of land we're looking for, um, how the interconnection plays in, you know, in terms of how the facilities are connected to the electric grid, and how that might be relevant to, to you and your your, your ordinances and, and such. Um, you know, who's responsible for taking care of them? Um, I want to touch on battery storage, um, some civil engineering related. Um, activities and landscaping um, touch on 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 questions around you know sound and glare and, and decommissioning uh, a little bit about state law um, and then talk further um, with any questions and, and some handouts as well okay so <clears throat> what you know what is a what is a solar farm what are the basics uh, um, it, it typically involves, um, you know, rows of rows of solar modules um, that are mounted in sometimes in portraits, sometimes in landscape. There's there's different different ways to do it. Uh, there's spacing between the rows um, that can vary. Uh, that's kind of the, th the theme here. A lot of this can can, can vary, um, and it involves some sort of basic gravel access road. Um, you know, out to a public road somewhere. Um, this is this is not your typical commercial or residential development. We we don't need to pave anything. Um, oftentimes, we don't even need to gravel anything. Um, really, just do that for construction purposes. And once the facility is built, um, and just kind of uh, we just kind of come and go occasionally throughout the year uh, for maintenance and monitoring uh, using light you know light pickup trucks or ATVs um, to get around the facility. Um, there are, you know, there are inverters involved, um, which are typically mounted in some way to a concrete pad. Uh, sometimes that pad is poured on site. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it's it's uh, poured off site and 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 brought on a flatbed. Um, and that that pad can just be, you know, lifted up and moved um, if needed in in the future. Um, and and so I'll talk a little bit about inverters, but that 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 is what converts. Um, you know, the sun's energy uh, converts it from, from DC to, to AC. 
Um, and then there's a there's always going to be a security fence of some kind, and that can come in different uh, different designs and shapes and heights. Um, you know, depending on your community, you can look at you can look look at requirements around that uh, for uh, aesthetic purposes. Um, and there, there is a national electric code that um, that requires you know a minimum height and, and minimum security standard for uh, for fencing and gates and such. Um, and then there's, of course, you know, setbacks and, and vegetative buffers. Um, typically, you know, our company, our industry uh, typically does that automatically in some way, but certainly um, that's something a lot of communities, a lot of jurisdictions in, in Virginia have looked at requirements around that. Um, and that's, you know, there's a, there's a huge variety of, of different landscaping requirements to look at. <clears throat> So again, on the on the basics here, um, like I said, the you know the, the solar modules are, are mounted in some way to a racking system. There's uh, a variety of different racking systems, um, and there's a there's also of course a different variety of solar panel or module uh, technologies um, that are involved. I'll get into that a little bit here, um, and then an inverter, like I mentioned. Um, the inverters are what convert um, convert the sun's energy from from DC uh, to AC, um, and then there's a there's a transformer involved as well that uh, that's used to step up that power uh, that can be that can then be um, interconnected into the grid in some way. So one um, you know one major difference. That you might see uh, across the state is um, is a difference between uh, what's called a single axis tracker system versus a fixed tilt. That's fairly self-explanatory. Um, you can see the the fixed tilt system is in the the photo um, on the right, um, and you know you have two two panels there uh, that are mounted on you know on top of each other, uh, mounted in portrait there. And in that scenario, your rows are going to be running um, from from west to east, um, to and they don't move. And so that's that's maximizing um, the ability of the system to uh, collect the sun's energy um, in the best way possible. Um, and you know, then the the system on the le on the left, uh, it's a single axis axis tracker. Um, if someone just calls it a tracker, that's probably this is what they are most likely referring to. Um, these rows run north and south, and so they'll follow the sun across the sky um, in a movement that's, of course, unnoticeable um, to the naked eye. Um, it does it very slowly. Um, <clears throat> I, I will point out, you know, in, in this scenario, the the rows are. Um, are typically much wider or need to be wider um, to to accommodate this type of system um, than the fixed tilt system um, and this is to avoid uh, shading so one you know one concern we have is certainly vegetation and the uh, adjacent row uh, shading uh, the row next to it and so these these have to be sp uh, spaced out a certain way uh, to avoid shading um, and then also you know Maintenance folks really like to be able to drive uh, drive a pickup truck down each row. Uh, that's also kind of an emergency services uh, best practice as well. Um, in a tracker system scenario, um, the overwhelming majority of the day, the the modules are going to be um, more parallel to the ground. Um, so this image you see here is they're kind of more almost perpendicular to the ground, um, but you know, certainly through the, through the bulk of the day, um, they're parallel to the ground to, uh, again, that's, that's optimal um, configuration uh, to absorb uh, the sun's energy. Um, and then dawn and dusk scenario is, is when they're more, um, they're more perpendicular to, you know, to maximize that sunlight collection uh, along the horizon. Okay, get into site suitability. Um, we consider contiguous land from anywhere from 
50 to 100, I'm sorry, 50 to 1,000 plus acres in size. Uh, we assess the property for compatibility with utility infrastructure um, and proximity to, uh, you know, to a power substation perhaps. Um, so that can be, you know, your neighborhood distribution lines. It can mean, um, uh, for certain size, for certain size systems, it can mean a distribution line, and then for your larger systems, um, it's involving, uh, you know, transmission lines that that might crisscross uh, your your county or locality. Um, we of course note the topography and the, and the slopes. Um, for the most part, um, we you know we try to avoid grading as much as possible um, because that's expensive. Um, and technology is really, uh, well, the technology for all of this is improving by the, every, you know, every year, um, seems like almost by the month, um, but certainly there's, there's technology available uh, for construction purposes today that allow us to install these systems with the existing grade, uh, gently sloping hills and that sort of thing. Um, and so we also, you know, we look for, we do desktop analysis to, to look for wetlands um, perennial streams um, and are able to avoid those. Um, and we also do land evaluations that consider, um, you know, potential cropland, environmental and wildlife concerns and attempts to uh, leave as much existing vegetation um, in place as possible. And of course, also, you know, we're working with a landowner for, for or a family um, or a company or, you know, even a logging company, something like that. Um, so we consider future plans of those landowners um, for for siting um, as well, of course. Okay, um, I mentioned a couple times now an interconnection point. Um, you know, for those of you that might not know what I'm what I'm re referencing there, um, this picture is a I believe it's a five megawatt um, or, or three megawatt system. Um, in, in eastern North Carolina, um, so it's on, uh, you know, for, for our business, for our industry, it's certainly on this on the smaller side, um, and it's a distribution site, which means it it can be interconnected um, into three phase uh, distribution lines, uh, the, you know, the typical power lines you see going down a you know rural uh, residential road, and you can see. There in the bottom left corner of the, of the image, um, the the interconnection poles um, looks like three or four um, poles are needed, and and those poles are running you know perpendicular to the like I said the existing power lines running down the road, um, and so we, we interconnect that way. Typically, typically above ground, it can happen below ground as well, um, and we'll we'll connect that you know above above ground using overhead poles and lines, um, and then that, that, that power is run back to the, the nearest substation uh, and distributed to the grid from there. Okay. Well, I guess before, you know, before I, I, I move on here, um, staying on the, the interconnection topic, for a transmission system, for a system that's that's much lar larger in the several hundred acre range, you know, where we're connecting to a um, to a transmission line, that typically involves us building our own um, substation and connecting it to uh, the power lines from there. And I, I wish I had a picture of that uh, to show you, but I don't. Okay, so some more um, design considerations. Um, this is a, a drone photo here that I think gives a, a good perspective of what's going on. Um, just kind of mentioning some things I've, I've, I've mentioned previously. Um, you know, during during the dry seasons, um, roads like like that interior kind of um, gravel or dirt road you see um, inside the perimeter fence there, uh, it would be kept wet to reduce dust. Um, you know, wet seasons naturally keep dust down, of course, um, and you know the natural weather conditions, um, such as snow and rain, will will reduce the need for um, for panel cleaning. Um, 
like I said, the, the rows are spaced in a way for, um, they're, they're spaced at a distance for trucks or ATVs to, uh, to travel um, in between each row uh, to access, excuse me, each row, each row of modules. Um, like I mentioned before, there's a perimeter security fence, which you can see here. Um, an optimal design involves uh, is what you're seeing in this image. And so there's there should be at least 20, uh, 40, 50 feet um, in between the uh, the edge of the last um, solar module and the fence. And and that that is that's on purpose so that there's um, there's the ability for uh, emergency vehicles or just light trucks to uh, kind of travel around the perimeter um, the perimeter of the facility. Um, and you can see uh, there's a there's a perimeter um, you know setbacks and, and buffers in this image as well. Um, and, and just to note, this is a uh, this is a fixed tilt um, system in the, in this image. Okay, a lot of questions I get revolve around um, the question of maintenance um, and who is responsible, who owns the system, who's taking care of it. Um, how, you know, how does that work? Who's going to fix something? Uh, something breaks. Um, you know, who who can I call if if my my dog digs digs under the fence and gets into it? That that sort of thing. Um, those are all very very important questions. Um, one thing to note about, you know, to note about our systems um, in this ind industry um, is that they are um, remotely monitored. And so this is a picture of our um, remote monitoring facility um, in Research Triangle Park outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, um, where we monitor uh, every facility we have um, from our from our smallest to our largest across, across the country. Um, and from there, we they can from the computer screen they can tell uh, everything that's going on. So so we monitor wind, um, you know, rain, cloud cover, uh, the available um, sunshine, the performance of each you know, each room models. Um, they can see equipment malfunctions, um, and perhaps mo most importantly, uh, for your emergency services folks to know. Uh, is that they can be turned off. Uh, the whole system can be turned off um, remotely. Um, there's also there's also ways for um, you know certainly for utilities and for for our staff to uh, turn facilities off in in person as well out, out on out on the site. Um, <clears throat> and so you know when when it comes to uh, ownership, just just to be clear, um, it, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter who you know who might own the 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 dirt, the land underneath the facility. Um, it, it's 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 important to know that um, there is uh, a, a company like ours that is monitoring um, uh, that needs to monitor these facilities for their life. Um, you know we're we're in the electricity generating business, and so it's very important that these facilities operate uh, um, optimally um, throughout the year. Um, and that things get fixed right away if, if something um, if something's broken. And so, you know, once constructed, uh, the facilities they require um, very little maintenance. Um, and so, there's there's no need to build you know travel infrastructure to accommodate traffic. Um, electrical engineers will serve the the inverters and the transformers uh, on an average of of once a quarter. Um, those will probably need to be replaced um, eventually uh, before the facility reaches the end of its life. Um, you know, the solar panels themselves um, have a very low failure rate, um, and like everything else, they're, they're getting better every year. Um, they fail uh, one in ten thousand per per year um, is is the current failure rate that I, I could find access to, um, and they're you know they're very easily replaced from from existing inventory. Um, vegetation is generally maintained five to nine times per year, obviously, uh, depending on on the rain and, and um, you know how much the grass is growing. And that certainly includes mowing and, and um, 
spot spraying for weeds and that sort of thing. Okay. I want to touch on briefly uh, energy storage, battery storage. It's probably something that's worth uh, worth the time of, of you know Virginia APA to do an entire um, webinar on. Um, I'm just going to touch on it briefly. It's getting a little bit outside of my my expertise, um, but as this this diagram suggests, there's a dozen different, more than a dozen different applications. Um, for battery storage, um, uh, starting with the you know the transmission level to down to just the neighborhood home, uh, and you might have a battery uh, in in your garage that that is um, is charged by the, the panels on your roof. Um, and you know I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the utilities in your area uh, have been or or are planning on installing. Um, battery storage in some in some form uh, in, in your electric grid uh, in your communities. Uh, so that that's something to to look for. Uh, it's a it's a um, fast evolving uh, technology and topic, um, and is and is really going to change the way uh, I think the, the way energy is is um, produced and used uh, across the United States. Um, and so just briefly touching on on. On some of the technologies, and so there's there's balancing storage um, that might be associated with uh, you know a, a power plant in your community. Um, there's there's bulk storage that um, would be installed you know along transmission lines. Um, there's there's distribution level um, you know solar plus storage, which is where where it's it's relevant to us. Um, and there's kind of there's two types. Um, for solar farm application, and so there's there's what's what we call DC coupled and, and AC coupled, and so uh, DC coupled solar plus storage um, involves a a battery system of some kind uh, to be co-located with the inverter uh, that's that's centrally located to the solar farm, um, and then the uh, on the flip side, AC coupled. Um, involves batteries that are installed, um, you know, out, typically outside of the system, perhaps adjacent to a, a substation. Um, the, the big difference there is that is that the, uh, the the former is involves batteries that are kind of spread out throughout the system, um, and and then the the latter, the 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 AC coupled, uh, involves battery storage um, clustered in in one area. Um, that's kind of that's really the main um, the main difference from a from a project design um, regulatory um, point of view. And then I, I really won't get into the behind the meter um, energy storage applications. Uh, you know, lots to consider there. There's there's um, commercial behind the meter storage where you know perhaps a university or a hospital um, uses batteries uh, for you know. Emergency purposes, um, and so lots lots to consider um, in this emerging um, technology. Okay, so moving on quickly into I got several slides here just on construction and 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 how that works and and some of the some of the things involved um, and how we. Uh, how we construct these facilities. Again, for your benefit, I got two images here of a, one on the left is a fixed tilt system. And then the one on the right you can see is a, is a single access tracker uh, facility uh, where those modules are actually um, parallel to the ground. Okay, so <clears throat> typical you know, civil uh, surface impacts uh, for a solar installation involve uh, you know early site prep uh, with with limited grading. Um, there's there's kind of a depending on the technology we use. There's a there's a max slope that we're that we're looking for, and and so we'll uh, in some applications uh, consider grading that. 
uh, or just build around it uh, to avoid that. And then depending on what's out on, on site, there's, there's clearing and grubbing um, involved, removing you know, shrubs and trees and that sort of thing. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show some images of a lot of this, um, but there's, it involves driven posts. And so we, uh, the racking is, is mounted to steel posts, which are, which are pile driven, um, very similar to the way that that wooden post in that, you know, on that hog fence, um, uh, is installed into the ground. And so, you know, there's nothing, there's no concrete involved, um, in that. It's, it's just, you know, it's easily pulled up um, at the end of the life of the facility. <clears throat> and uh, probably not in Virginia, but in other, other um, localities where there's geology um, and, and rock involved, uh, we can use uh, what we call ground screws um, to more easily, or, or I guess really the only way uh, to mount them to the ground is to use a, to use a ground screw. Also, um, trenching. So all you know, all the wiring from each row, um, you know, runs under under the modules, um, down to the ground, uh, to a, a series of trenches um, that that run back to the, the interconnection point. Um, I've I've discussed you know the in, inverter transformer pads, um, interconnection poles. Um, there's access roads. Uh, certainly might need need culverts and, and uh, stormwater um, BMPs, of course, as well. Uh, I've mentioned a perimeter fence. Um, you can see in this image, there's a, uh, we did not use a, a, a chain link fence, but there's a, uh, what I think is a prettier um, hog fence with wooden posts um, and then landscaping as well. Uh, landscape buffering, of course, um, when needed. Okay, so I've mentioned we use driven post foundations. Um, you can see, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You know how this works. Um, you can see the, the image on, on the right there uh, with pile driver. Um, that's really the first step. Um, you know, once the ground is cleared and, and seeded in some way um, to install that. For a, for a 20 megawatt facility, um, you're looking at uh, which is probably in the 300 acre range, depending on uh, depending on the, the site. Um, approximately 13 posts uh, per rack, um, and 87 panels um, per rack for for that for that size facility. Um, and and yeah, so you know, one thing, just one kind of theme here. All this equipment is. Um, designed, it's installed, um, it's built all, all in, a, in a way to be temporary. And so, um, you know, the, the end goal um, is for all of the equipment and the facility to be decommissioned and removed and to be um, uh, easily removed. Um, it's financed that way. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's required to be, to be built that way. Um, and so, you know, just keep in mind with all this, there's, there's nothing, um, you know, that I would consider permanently affixed to the ground. Um, and so it, it can all be taken apart and, and, and removed. And that's, um, that's very much on purpose. Here's a good, um, good image I'd like to use just, just to show you kind of how um, each module is, um, is, is wired together. And it gets you a good, good close up of, um, you know, what a single access tracker system um, uh, looks like from, from this angle at, at, at con, uh, early construction period. Okay, so, you know, certainly um, compared to other land uses that, that, that are permanent, um, and, and other types of utility infrastructure, um, you know, I, I would consider these a, a low impact um, form of development um, in terms of the, you know, certainly the, you know, the impact on the earth. 
Uh, there's very little site grading, um, even with clearing and grubbing. Um, you know, we, we seek to maintain the, the topography of the land. Um, we really don't like to remove soil or anything from the site. And so there's, there's limited uh, excavation, um, limited trenching um, and drainage improvements. Um, you know, there's certainly stormwater is, you know, very, very important to us. It's very important to Virginia. Um, and so there's, there's certainly a variety of, of stormwater BMPs that, that need to be installed um, to maintain the facility and, and, and water quality and, and quantity issues. Um, and yeah, like, like I, like I said, the, the posts are installed by, um, using pile driving, um, or ground screws, um, to, to originally install the facility. Okay, just, a, you know, just a little bit about landscaping plans. I'm sure this is something you, you have experience with uh, for other land uses in your community. Uh, uh, it's something I'd strongly, you know, consider uh, you looking at um, in terms of establishing requirements or, or talking to, uh, you know, professionals in the, in the industry or, or consultants um, about, um, you know, there's a variety of, of ways to do this. Um, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit analogous to a, like a kind of screening a, a, a big box store or a, or a, a drug store, I suppose, um, except that they're, they're certainly shorter um, and uh, typically, you know, located in more um, remote or, or rural areas um, and certainly en encourage um, folks to consider, you know, a variety of, of plant species, um, a variety of deciduous and evergreens, um, just for longevity purposes. Um, also given a, uh, a variety of heights um, will help screen the facility um, as, as, as those plants grow in, um, you know, look more natural that way. Um, and it will be hidden from different vantage points. Um, Typically, in my in my experience, I you know I'm somewhat in the aesthetics business, um, and so I, I hate to 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 say what you know what the fact is there, but um, typically I find that people think the fence uh, the fencing is the um, uh, ugliest part of, of these facilities, um, and so that's you know that's typically what we're trying to hide. Um, certainly, looking at other types of fencing might be a way to uh, aid, um, you know, aid in that goal. Um, and let's see, I think that's, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, one image I like to share with folks is, is that, that you're probably familiar with is, is the, um, the cross section, um, in the top right of this, of this image, um, is, is a great way that I, th I think to show, um, you know, planning commissioners and, and, uh, elected officials, um, kind of exactly how, um, and neighbors, of course, um, show them how, you know, landscaping plan is going to work and how, um, you know, th that we're serious about location and, and species type and, and, and the caliper size and that sort of thing. Okay. Moving on to, um, to sound. Um, the only thing that makes a sound uh, on these facilities are the inverters. Um, and so, you know, they, they produce a sound when operating during the hours of, of peak power production. And so that's like right now, um, in the middle of the day, uh, when the, the sun is shining brightest. And so it actually gets louder as, as, the, uh, as the energy from the, you know, the sun increases um, and then you know, at nighttime, it makes it makes no sound, um, no sound at all. It, uh, you know, depends on on who you ask. I, I think, to me, uh, when I'm out at a facility, it sounds a little bit like a hair dryer, um, just in terms of, of the way it sounds. Um, <clears throat> and in this this image, I'm I'm hoping to to show you just kind of the the distance. Um, the distances needed to um, remove yourself from from hearing anything, 
Um, and so at, at what we found is at 150 feet um, from an inverter, um, you know, measured from the, the inverter itself, um, the sound is inaudible above, you know, natural ambient noise in rural areas. And so birds chirping and the wind and, and just uh, cars driving by, that sort of thing, um, it will all just blend into the, the background noise. And so, um, you know, certainly um, hope you consider um, making sure, certainly in residential areas, that um, inverters are located um, at that distance or, or, or greater from, you know, from residential properties. Um, the, the good thing is, uh, like this image depicts, um, for efficiency purposes, we, you know, we construct these, these systems to have the inverter uh, essentially located to the site. So it's actually, it's put in the middle on purpose, um, really have to do that. And so that, that typically keeps them um, at that distance from, from residential properties. Um, but, you know, I'd certainly encourage you to look at, um, you know, setbacks, increased setbacks for, for inverters. Um, and, and really that, that goes for all this equipment. I, I, you know, I would, it's, it's more difficult to explain to, to residents and elected officials. Um, but I, you know, I would, I would encourage you to look at, diff, you know, varying setbacks for the different types of equipment with these facilities, whether it's the perimeter fence or the inverters or the modules themselves. Um, they're kind of different elements, um, and so I, you know, I would I would consider consider that if you're looking at you know ordinance changes or developing a solar ordinance. Um, you know, like I said, that um, at peak power production, uh, between roughly between 10 a.m. 2 p.m., uh, the sound created is in the 65 decibel range, measured at 30 feet um, from the inverter, um, and that sound can be kind of that's in the range of a of a normal conversation between uh, a couple of different people, and so um, keep that in mind. Uh, and and also, there's there's no sound. Like I said, there's no sound produced um, produced at night. Okay, quickly on glare. Um, solar panels, solar modules, they're designed to absorb light from the visual spectrum, not reflect it. Uh, although some upward reflection can occur um, to assist this light absorption, each panel is treated with an anti-reflectivity coating. Um, additionally, solar panels are mounted at an angle that allow for the most light to be absorbed throughout the year, which results in panels facing the sky um, at shallow angles, as you saw in those, those images. Um, so what little light that is reflected uh, is not visible to, uh, to ground level observers um, and so it's, it's typically you know aerial observers and so you know all solar farms are required to be uh, approved or reviewed by the FAA um, or at least found to not need a formal review by the FAA uh, to avoid potential um, glare hazards for aviators um, and to date you know for our facilities uh, no array has been deemed a glare hazard um, and there's a number of, of solar projects built you know next to highways next to airports um, on tops of the you know on top of the terminal um, and so this is the largest um, airport co-located solar farm in the United States at the Indianapolis International Airport um, there's you know there's solar modules uh, the approach to the runway at, the, at Denver International there's there's uh, rooftop array on top of uh, Boston Logan International Airport as well. Uh, so it's a very common, um, you know, co-located uh, type of land use. Um, so that's that's glare. Um, decommissioning, another big big topic. Something I get a lot of questions on. Um, that I'll, I'll just kind of go through. Um, uh, how the, the process works, um, you know, once the lease has ended, um, the owner and operator of the facility um, is supposed to remove all the equipment and, and modules from, from the solar farm um, and will be responsible for any of those associated costs. Um, like I said before, all, all of the equipment um, is designed 
uh, and installed um, and financed and constructed in a, in a way to be temporary. Uh, and it's it's kind of an unusual land use in that sense uh, that nothing is is permanently, um, uh, you know, I'll put permanently in, in quotes, um, installed to, you know, to the earth. The lifespan of a solar uh, PV panel is approximately 20 to 30 years, um, while the lifetime of an inverter uh, can be, is more like 10 to 15 years. Um, therefore, many solar products have not yet reached um, the end of their life. And in fact, um, panels installed in, in the early 80s using different older technologies are, st are, are often still performing um, at effective levels. Like most other durable products and construction materials, solar equipment can, can, can last for decades with, with proper maintenance. Um, in some cases, PV modules can be reused or refurbished or recycled, um, which are, you know, as you know, th sort of the same thing, but, but three different things in, in, in a sense. Um, other components of solar systems um, uh, can also be recycled uh, when handled responsibly. Um, inverters can be recycled as, as e-waste and, and racking equipment um, that, that will involve aluminum or steel um, can be reutilized with, with newer technology or, or recycled like, um, you know, like with other metals. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, recycling or refurbishing, um, the bulk of that to date occurs by the manufacturer. Um, you know, when equipment is uh, broken in transit, in transit um, across the globe or the country, um, you know, that equipment is returned to the manufacturer and refurbished in some way. Um, there's also, a, a, you know, a variety of uh, recycling facilities and refurbishing uh, facilities um, uh, across the United States. Uh, and I provided a, a link here on this slide and at the end of the presentation as well, where you can learn more about those. Um, and just for your, for your reference, for those of you that don't know, um, there was a bill, Senate bill, uh, 1091 and house bill 2621 out, out of Richmond, uh, was bonding provisions for decommissioning of solar energy facilities, uh, goes into effect. I think it's either June one or July one. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but that, uh, requires that that's that set in place some decommission requirements um, and, and bonding requirements uh, for our industry. Um, so, you know, be sure to, to, to look that up um, as you're considering uh, solar applications in your communities. So I wanted to touch on a little bit um, as to what, you know, what is, uh, what's driving some of the, the interest. And so, there is a lot more demand for renewable energy and solar energy uh, in Virginia than there is supply. Um, and that, that demand is really growing as far as I, I can see. Um, and so the cost of renewable power has fallen dramatically in, in recent years. Um, and in parallel to that demand, um, customer, customer demand um, and affordable, you know, affordable equipment, uh, sources of affordable equipment has also gone up. So as of 2017, 63% um, of Fortune 100 companies had set targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and buy clean energy. Um, and as renewable energy has become more and more cost effective um, and companies are setting more ambitious goals to buy it, you know, large companies are increasingly looking for ways to contract directly for renewable energy um, uh, to protect against future energy prices, uh, price increases, um, and meet their, you know, their climate, uh, climate change and renewable energy goals. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're looking for, for clean energy in, in different places. Um, and so that can be anyone from, you know, from General Motors to, uh, you know, to Marriott hotels. It also, it can involve um, universities, um, nonprofits and other types of um, other entities as well. It's important to note, I, I think there's some confusion around this topic. You know, these facilities, wherever they're built, um, you know, the electricity is, is generated on site and used um, downstream, if you will, uh, from that facility. 
Um, and so, you know, in circumstances where there is a um, an entity like this, um, you know, paying for that paying for that facility or not the facility, but the the power, so to speak, um, to exist, um, that power is not being transferred physically on the grid uh, to some other loca you know, some other location. Um, it's 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 still being used, um, you know, on site uh, by the community that that uh, is located with it. Okay, this just a quick slide on uh, Virginia DEQ's permit by rule, um, which is a kind of an omnibus uh, DEQ regulation for our industry. Um, I'm not going to uh, get into it too, too much. I think there's other other sources for this information, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on the topic. It, it does involve um, uh, a dozen, or I think it's 14 exactly, um, different you know application components, um, and I, I, I'll get into those a little bit here. But um, the permit. Um, you know, like I said, is administered by uh, Virginia DEQ, um, and it largely involves, you know, environmental and, and habitat um, considerations as well as historical um, resource considerations. Um, I, I think it's sometimes more important to to point out what it what it doesn't involve, um, which is, you know, local permitting and and siting or zoning. Um, it, it doesn't involve the uh, you know the wetland delineation process uh, that we go through for uh, with the U.S. Army Corps, um, and it also doesn't involve um, storm water. Um, although there's certainly a, a nexus between all all three of those things, um, and so there's a separate you know state level or county level storm water um, permitting process that we that we go through and is. Uh, um, actually, you know, typically substantially uh, lengthier process, and so the you know the permit by rule involves a um, it involves a notice of intent, and so so publishing the notice of the project somewhere. Um, it, re it requires us to share interconnection studies, um, a final interconnection agreement, um, a certification that a facility does not exceed 150 megawatts. Um, it involves air quality analysis, uh, cultural wildlife and natural heritage resource assessments. Um, uh, if appropriate, it involves mitigation plans for those things. Um, there's coastal avian protection zones in, in Virginia you, may, you might be aware of. Um, and there's a site map, context map. Um, and, oops, sorry about that. And a 30-day public comment period um, where you know the public is is notified um, of the permit application, um, and there's a, a community meeting associated with that as well. The other thing to note, kind of at the state uh, state code level, um, which is um, handled different, you know, differently in every locality I've worked with so far across the state. Uh, it's a little it's a little bit unusual. Um, there's a state code. Um, 15.2-2232 um, that involves, you know, the, the public facilities are subject to, which requires these facilities to be deemed in, in substantial accordance with the comprehensive plan of the community. Um, and this process may be carried out concurrently or separately uh, to any additional local permit reviews. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, something that's been carried out differently uh, across the state. So certainly something to discuss with your um, you know, your county administrators, your county attorneys uh, sooner than later um, to, to get their take on it. Um, it, it there's different, it kind of depends on which attorney you ask in terms of uh, how it's applicable. Um, you know, most solar facilities like these are, are privately developed and privately held. Um, and so, so what, you know, whether they meet the definition of a public facility um, is, is something is so far typically found to be the answer to that question is, has been yes, um, but there's some uh, some debate over that question as well. Um, so yeah, if you if you have uh, you know solar applications before you, definitely take take a look at the 2232 um, Virginia Code uh, sooner than later. 
Okay, last slide here. Um, just wanted to provide you some some links uh, to more information. Um, I think three or four of these are included. Sarah included them as as handouts um, for you. Um, there's the Solar Jobs Census of 2017, which gets down to state and county level, um, you know, jobs that are, that are involved. Um, there's further explanation from the industry on on how solar energy works. Um, the recycling uh, initiatives that I mentioned. Um, uh, there's a there's a couple there's some good links on on further study of battery storage I encourage you to look at um, and then I provided I think it's it's North Carolina and 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 Virginia um, I think it's the University of Virginia have have put together a, a model ordinance for these facilities to take a look at as well um, and so with that I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, um, send you more information. Um, like I said, the first slide here has my my phone and email, um, so I'm happy to do, um, to talk further with anyone and everyone. And I think with that, I'll, I'll Sarah. I'm not sure if, if you want to take questions or how how best to take questions if people have it. But yeah, so that's all I've got for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a, well, first of all, thank you very much for doing that webinar. Um, I think that was a lot of great information about what's going on in Virginia. Before I get to the couple questions that we have um, about three years ago, just a note, APA Virginia was one of the stakeholders involved in developing the permit by rule for both solar and wind. Um, and that went, oh, great. Um, discussions went on for about 10 months. So I just thought it would be good to note um, that relevance. Um, so we are very supportive of this industry. Um, first question is from John. He asks, is there any experience with these facilities getting hit by tornadoes? Um, I'm not aware of, of a tornado direct hit. Um, Certainly, well, if there's a direct hit of a of a severe tornado, I mean, you know, most or all of the equipment would be would be damaged um, and probably need to be replaced in some way. Um, you know, the bulk of the solar development in in the eastern seaboard has occurred um, in eastern North Carolina, uh, which you may have noticed is prone to hurricanes. And so there's been, you know, there there has been some farms that have sustained hurricane damage. Um, experienced and lived lived through uh, hurricane force winds and and um, and flooding and that sort of thing and so um, you know we we had a, several hurricanes over the last few years that have have hit our facilities um, and you know we're, we're pleased to see them um, you know function properly and 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 get get back to to operating optimally uh, in, in a quick amount of time but yeah I'm not I'm not aware of a of a tornado direct hit to, to my knowledge. Alrighty, next question is from Jeffrey asking, what is the country of origin for typical solar equipment? Is it locally produced and sourced? Are the typical operating companies like Cypress Creek based in the United States? <clears throat> yeah, so that's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, when it comes to you know, a company like ours, we are, um, you know, we're, we're a construction company and long-term um, operator and maintenance company. But, you know, we are U.S. based. We're, we're based in North Carolina and, and California. Um, when it comes to the equipment, um, which it sounds like that that's the, the gist of the, the question. Um, you know, like everything electronic um, these days, they're, they're sourced and, and assembled. Uh, you know, with with parts from from around the world, um, you know, there's the the bulk of which is is um, is from Asia. When when we're talking about the solar modules themselves, um, you know, inverters are are some are manufactured in the United States. They're they're also kind of a global industry. Um, um, you know, you saw an image of an SMA inverter in, in, in one of these these slides from from Germany. Um, other equipment, the steel and aluminum racking, um, 
you know, and a lot of the, the, the wiring and other equipment um, is often sourced um, from from the U.S. Um, and then just to just to note, you know, there's a a competitor a competitor of ours um, called First Solar, uh, which manufactures thin film uh, solar man, uh, solar modules um, in Arizona. So, yeah, there's lots there's kind of lots of lots of answers to that to that question. Uh, but that's, that's the best one I got. All right. Next question, also from Jeffrey. Have there been any efforts to locate solar farms in major electricity transmission rights of way? They seem like wide open areas with limited shadow effects. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It, it seems like just from a, a a civil point of view or a physical point of view that that would certainly work and make sense. I, I assume the gentleman's talking about like a, a natural gas corridor or or um, something like that. Um, it, it's it's theoretically possible, but um, there's there's been no research into that uh, you know that initiative that that I know of. All right, next, um, next question is from Sarah asking to please give examples of fully operational 1,000 plus acre sites. Yeah, um, example, I assume uh, she means like the location or something like that. Um, there's a number of facilities. Uh, I, would, I would encourage Sarah to e email me. Um, I, I gave her more details, but there's a number of these facilities, you know, in, in California and in southwestern United States, um, that are that that size or larger. Um, we have operational facilities that are in in that range from the, you know, the 900 uh, to 1,000 acre plus, um, in North Carolina and, and South Carolina. Uh, there's there's one north of Durham. There's one uh, east of Charlotte, in Union County, I believe. Uh, it might be the it might be the county to the east of Union County um, that that are in that um, that are in that size range. Okay. Um, and Sarah and everyone who's still on here, I will send Parker's email in the follow up email that you'll receive if if you want to reach out to him after this. And then um, so this is the last question that I have. So if anyone has a question, go ahead and send it in. This is from Katie. Do you know of any solar installs in wetland areas where permitting has been allowed or on FEMA buyout parcels? I'm sorry, you said FEMA. Repeat that last part. Um, sure. Or on FEMA buyout parcels, as in the mm. FEMA. Um, I'm not familiar with FEMA buyout parcels, uh, but but you know wetlands in general, um, you know there's a number of facilities uh, that are located on parcels of land uh, that have wetlands that you know they're typically uh, always in my experience you know we're, we're building around those those wetlands. Um, it, you know, wet, wetlands can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes it's 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 dry most of the year. Sometimes they're, invo they're involving you know perennial streams or in, intermittent um, stream beds, um, and the you know and the topography that's associated there. And so, um, you know, 99% of the time, um, you know, we're not we're not building over or constructing on on top of those uh, those natural features, um, but they but they certainly might be located inside of our fence line. Uh, or adjacent to our to our projects, um, just kind of co-located with them. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. So I think that's it for questions. Thank you everyone for those questions that you did send in. And again, be on the lookout for that email that will tell you how to log your CM credit if you're going to do that and how to sign up for next month's webinar. Um, Parker, thank you for giving us your time today. And to the attendees, thank you for giving us your lunch hour. I just got one comment saying this was an informative presentation. Thank you. Um, awesome. It's always good to hear. And Parker's email will be in that email if you'd like to reach out to him separately. Um, but 
other than that, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. I hope you'll have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.